I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco and for Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, U.S. banks post earnings this week. Wells Fargo says it needs to be a tech company. Bank of America says tech keeps banks relevant. We'll have a preview plus what it means for bonuses. Plus the heartbeat of healthcare. Technology and health are linked like never before. We'll head to the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference to talk 2020 trends. And Sonos sues Google in a patent dispute, but is the custom sound system company showing trademarks of a takeover? We'll talk the survivability of upstarts in the big tech era. Now, first, just want to bring you some breaking news. The U.S. Treasury has named uh, 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 no currency manipulators in its FX report. So effectively taking China off uh, of being a currency manipulator. So again, the U.S. Treasury has named no currency manipulators in their foreign exchange report. We will bring you more headlines as we get them. But again, we know that China was put on that uh, designation list back in August. So, of course, being removed to Day. But I want to get back to our top story, and it is all about earnings season, and it is here again. And the big banks are set to report this week, with the biggest of them having spent billions on technology back in 2019. And that investment could be bringing a big change to Wall Street's bonus culture, possibly making that a thing of the past as traders are being forced to unlearn some of their most basic assumptions about making money. Joining us from New York to discuss, it is Bloomberg finance reporter, Lenon Nguyen. Lenon, great to have you here. What are we learning about unlearning the bonus culture on Wall Street? Thanks, Taylor. What we are unlearning is that uh, bonuses are maybe a thing of the past. Um, in the past, uh, traders were always judged as kind of these, uh, you know, big players in the markets who could make outsized bets and then make outsized profits and money on the back of that. But now, because of automation, because of electronification, traders are starting to make less money because, to be honest, the machines are doing the work for them. And so they just can't garner that type of paycheck anymore. You know, Lenon, you and I joke about this all the time. Instead of going back to CFA school, we're going to go to coding school. What happens to these traders who don't yet know how to code? So I think there's a range of things, but what traders are trying to do now, and at least the smart ones, are trying to build in that transition for the future. While there ne may never be sort of heavy quants or data scientists or PhDs in physics, they need to get up to speed, at least with some of these techniques that are being used on the street, whether it's algorithmic trading or electronic trading. They need to at least understand a little bit of the machinery behind that work in order to stay relevant in the future. It doesn't mean that they're going to write the code necessarily, but they need to have some fluency with that topic. You know, it's interesting, even though quants and traders of those type are in high demand, it's not necessarily uh, translating into a raise in compensation. Why the discrepancy? Well, it's interesting now because it seems like these skills are really just table stakes. So a recruiter that I spoke to said that even though quants are in very high demand and even though all the firms really want to make sure that they have a lot of quant talent, that doesn't necessarily mean that the salaries and bonuses have come up in any substantial way. So it almost seems like there's an emphasis on cutting costs and that means that the basic level of skill you're going to have to have is going to require a lot more technical skill. Do you think this is really just the beginning of what looks like a more broader structural change that is undergoing the financial markets at this point? I do, and a lot of the experts I've spoken to have also said the same, as well as some traders sort of lamenting the good old days of the past. So it does seem like these technical skills are going to stay with us and that the pace of technological innovation and movement within the financial markets is going to continue. And so if people want to stay relevant, they need to learn, they need to upskill and be able to make that transition into an automated future. And any other reaction from the street? Um, a lot of emails from traders saying, oh, yeah, I wish that uh, I wish that I uh, had you know, gotten up to speed and maybe I should take a class or something. So, yes, there, there have been a lot of kind of uh, soul searching emails from my sources today saying that they're thinking ahead. Can you remind us again, just for size and scope, how many actual jobs are we talking about that have the potential to be automated? 
Um, these The people I spoke to haven't really said because I think it's just too wide to quantify. I think everyone's job is going to be affected by technology. And so there isn't a precise number, but you know, all of the, the roles in, say, equities or foreign exchange, a lot of these markets that are very highly electronic are already seeing this change. And then on top of that, everyone is talking about the bond market electronifying and becoming more automated as well. So uh, those are the most uh, intuitive markets to sort of see this transformation but eventually this could head into investment banking as well. Well, that was Bloomberg's Lenon Nguyen. Thank you for joining us. And we'll continue our coverage bank earnings all week as the numbers, of course, do come in. And in some M&A news in the financial world, Visa has agreed to buy Plaid. It's a network that makes it easy for people to securely connect their financial accounts to the apps they use for about $5.3 billion. Visa will fund the deal with cash and debt, and there is expected to be no impact on Visa's previously announced stock buyback program or dividend policy. The deal is expected to close in the next three to six Six months. And coming up, we'll talk to one of the biggest hospital systems in the U.S. My conversation with the CEO of Providence St. Joseph Health from the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference next. And as we go to break, I want to talk again about some more headlines that we are getting. The U.S. has removed China as a foreign currency manipulating a manipulator. They're citing their foreign exchange commitments. The U.S. Treasury has named no currency manipulators in that foreign exchange report. China has made some enforceable comments on currency. This is all according to Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin. Again, the U.S. Treasury has issued uh, some delayed semi-annual foreign exchange report. And again, holding talks with the PBOC see on their currency since August and since, of course, releasing, uh, originally putting them on that report in August, now removing China as a foreign exchange manipulator. Again, we will have more details as we get them. This is Bloomberg. The intersection of healthcare and technology is never more apparent than at the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference going on this week in San Francisco. It's the place where partnerships are announced and formed and predictions are made. One of the biggest hospital systems, Providence St. Joseph, announced a partnership with Microsoft in July. Its CEO, Rod Hockman, he joins me now with his 10 predictions for healthcare in 2020. Rod, great to have you. And one thing that really stood out on your list was health systems starting to prioritize digital access when it comes to uh, care and collaboration with big tech. Why do you see that being a prediction for you? Well, I think it's what everyone expects from every other service they have in the economy, that they expect to be able to get on their app, be able to make their appointment, be able to really do that the way they do with all the other services. And healthcare is finally waking up to that. So we're seeing this big revolution in the digital front end of healthcare, where all folks really want to do is they want to be able to figure out who their doctor is, what's wrong with them, and do it in you know a couple of clicks. Who have been some of the biggest disruptors, and do those disruptors continue in 2020? Oh, there's a whole list of them. Uh, you know, I think everyone wants to do healthcare. Uh, we're seeing, you know, the WalMarts of the world are in healthcare. Amazon is in healthcare. Uh, plus, there are a lot of startups that are kind of looking at, particularly the ambulatory space, to see what they can be doing in healthcare. So, um, I don't even worry about my traditional competitors anymore. I really think about all of the electronic startups that are around us. And what we've figured out is that we've got to be able to partner with those and create that digital front end that it makes it easy for our 13 million customers to, to get in touch with us. So do you view Amazon's early entry into this race as a threat or a very good motivator? <laughs> That's a good one. Well, I think both. I think both's the answer. And there are going to be certain things we're going to do with folks like Amazon. Um, I think what we saw in, in our Microsoft arrangement was that they really wanted to help us make healthcare better and not necessarily compete with us in our core business. And so that for, for us really made a lot of sense and 
this comprehensive relationship that we have looking at what the healthcare hospital or healthcare uh, spot of the future looks like is something that we're both working on together. You know, Rob, the big thing when you talk about healthcare and technology is data privacy and holding on to that sensitive information. Are health systems prepared to work with big tech on data privacy? And then I guess I wonder if big tech as well is, is doing enough to protect healthcare data. Uh, you've said it perfectly. I think we're very worried. You know, the one thing that our patients trust us is with their data. And they don't want to see us giving away their data to someone else and it's being out there being utilized for a whole. So we've been very protective about that relationship. So we're really looking for tech partners that are going to understand that. And we think that the difference is that the consumer really has to be in control of their data and they have to be a partner in this. So it's not like I'm going to just give up my data and hope that something happens. I think the consumer wants to be a partner in this data transfer and understand what protections they have uh, in giving that information over. How do you see voice assistant, assistance working within the health system? Well, I think you know one of the biggest problems that we have today, if any of you have gone to see your doctor recently, most of the time they're head down on a, a mouse or a keyboard and not making eye contact with you. We think ultimately voice activation and being able to get information through voice is going to be critical, particularly for clinicians. Because their biggest complaint, if you go to a group of nurses and doctors, is about the electronic health record, and particularly about them having to be data entry clerks. So they, you know, things like voice activation are going to really revolutionize the way that tool works. But right now, it's, it's, it's too clunky. It's both a dissatisfier for both the patient and the doctor. And I think voice activation is one of those things that's going to make it better for the clinicians that are out there. Well, my thank you to Rod Hockman. He is CEO of Providence St. Joseph Health. Now, I want to get to another conversation I had today at the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference. Lisa Gill is head of healthcare technology and distribution at J.P. Morgan. She's been a leading member of the healthcare equity research team at J.P. Morgan for about 16 years. I asked her about the role of small cap companies like LabCorp and Teladoc, how they play in the evolution of healthcare. Take a listen. LabCorp, um, really on the lab side, the integration there is more between medical and diagnostics. So they have a, a CRO, which was Covance, uh, marrying that together with a lab company and have done really well in being able to do patient recruitment, um, bringing new technology from a medical perspective to the marketplace. Uh, Teladoc is really, truly one of our favorite names and has been for a long time on the telehealth side. And as you think about marrying together consumer, where do you want the service? at the cost of the services, and what they made an acquisition or announced an acquisition yesterday of a company called InTouch. And so now this creates a broader platform for them to be able to touch people in the hospital, at home. They have a great relationship with CVS, so in the stores at CVS, and, and that opportunity to bring a physician. As you take a look at companies that are making heavy investments within AI, how is that poised to also be a disruptor within healthcare? Yeah, so I mean, I think as you think about artificial intelligence, um, I think that there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that when you start thinking about making decisions around healthcare where artificial intelligence can really play a part, I think when you look at things like value-based care, which is the direction that this country needs to move in, we need to move away from fee-for-service towards value-based care. And where that artificial intelligence comes in and looks at patient populations, looks at, okay, if you're a diabetic, what's going to happen to you next? What are the things that we need to do to keep you healthy? And not just from a physical perspective, but how about a mental perspective? And that's where companies like Teladoc come into play, where they have programs with better help, where you can get that help with that uh, individual to talk to that psychologist um, to walk through not just your mental, uh, not just your physical ailments, but your mental ailments. Were the threats of Amazon entering <laughs> this space overblown? You know, it, this is going to sound very strange to you right now, but I think Amazon coming into any space is actually really good for those companies. And the reason that I believe that is that companies in turn make big investments to try to compete against this, and it makes them better and smarter. 
And so when you think about a platform like Amazon, who really tailors to the consumer, it's made a lot of B2B companies rethink about how they're going to have that interaction in the marketplace, what technology they need to put in place in order to compete. And do you feel that that's made companies better off now than they were four years ago? They've been 100%. having to force to integrate. Yes, forced to integrate. Mm -hmm. um, you've had a lot of consolidation in healthcare services. You've seen CVS come together with Aetna. You've seen Cigna come together with Express Scripts. You've got United Healthcare that has a massive platform from a healthcare services perspective. And I think a lot of that is because of competition in the marketplace. How do you drive down costs? How do you drive efficiencies? And companies like Amazon, the threat of an Amazon, I really think creates the opportunity for these companies to think about things differently. And that sort of leaves us on a more broader note when we talk about some of the big issues in this space right now, drug pricing, transparency, and you talk about technology integrating and Medicare for all on the democratic platform. How is all of that forcing healthcare technology companies to look at the way they do business? Oh, absolutely. And, and I mean, I think that there's a few things um, as we just break those down. When you think about drug pricing, we believe that you should price the drug correctly. There should be a price for innovation. Uh, but at the same time, egregious drug pricing has to go away. And we, we're seeing that. We're, we're seeing drug pricing that's kind of mid-single digit right now, um, which makes sense, right, for the innovation that we have in the marketplace. When you think about transparency, you shouldn't have surprise billing. At the end of the day, you should know what you're paying for. Um, and again, that drives it back to the consumer. And then lastly, as we think about Medicare for All, I don't think it's as simple to get Medicare for All done as people believe. Uh, even if we have a Democrat that's elected to the White House, uh, most likely the the Senate will remain Republican, and it'll be difficult to come up with a bipartisan support. That was my conversation with Lisa Gill, J.P. Morgan Chase Managing Director and Senior Analyst. And coming up, Google's digital ad dominance. We look back at the final quarter of 2019 and what lies ahead this year. All of that next. This is Bloomberg. Netflix filling the Oscar nom love this Monday. The streaming giant has two of nine films nominated for Best Picture this year. The Irish Band and Marriage Story give Netflix its best chance yet to win Hollywood's most coveted prize. The online service, now the largest movie studio in the world by volume, has mostly been shut out of the biggest prizes. Last year's Netflix's Roma was seen as a favorite to win the top Oscar, but lost to Comcast's Green Book. Now, Alphabet saw its price target raised by 19% at Evercore. That would be equivalent to about $1,600. The call comes as Evercore says Alphabet, quote, continues to compound on its defensible dominance in search and video advertising. Now, our next guest has taken a look back on the digital ad space where he says things look positive with the strongest uptick belonging to Google. Joining me from New York to discuss, it is Pivotal Research Senior Analyst for Internet and Media, Michael Levine, and he currently has a buy rating on Alphabet. So, Michael, great to have you. What did your ad trends within the last few months show you about why Google is the best poised to out outperform? I mean, we think it'll outperform in terms of stocks, I'd say, within the, within the space. What I think you're talking to, Taylor, is our Pivotal Advertising Insights product, where we survey about 55 large agencies and large marketers encompasses probably about $10 billion of annualized spend in the United States. And what we saw over the course of the quarter was pretty clear increasing ad load in terms of the Google shopping products, as well as on YouTube, which tend to be seasonally very, very strong in the fourth quarter versus the third quarter. But we were pretty shocked when we saw the, uh, the significant improvement in ROIs we saw for the full quarter, not only looking at it versus the third quarter, because there is typical seasonality that improves in the fourth quarter. But when we looked at the Q4 versus Q3 seasonality in the, the, the last couple of years, I mean, it, it seemed pretty pronounced. You know, Michael, another stock that you mentioned that is poised to, you know, do well, do outperform relative to consensus is Snap. And if you come and take a look at a chart here that I'm showing inside my terminal, Snap, frankly, has, has been struggling. Right now, it's trading at $18. And frankly, the median price target from the street is only about $19 a share. What is Snap's angle here? Is it their young target niche audience? How does Snap stand out, frankly, amidst so many other bigger competitors? I mean, I think their execution has, has gone from being relatively lackluster over the last 15 months to being exceptional. I mean, you've had, you've had a real change in terms of senior management, CFO from, uh, from Amazon, 
the chief strategy officer, I should say, sorry, chief, uh, chief sales officer, um, Jeremy Gorman, also out of Amazon. So you've, you've really gone and, and, uh, and put some, some much more consistent best practices industry-wide into the company and just hearing phenomenally good feedback from the agencies, they're becoming more relevant, showing up more consistently on plans, um, so I, I, as we look out into, uh, into 2020, I mean, it was one of the ideas that we, we had highlighted. It was one of our favorite ideas for the year. Where does that then leave Amazon in the midst of all those other competitors that you mentioned? On the advertising side or, or just in general? Yes, advertising. You know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I have done a lot of checks basically talking to large agencies that, uh, that focus specifically on Amazon. I, I think something that a, that a lot of folks on the street don't necessarily understand or appreciate is it really is highly correlated for them with the GMV of the business. Uh, their, their ad business, for the most part, looks a lot more like Alibaba's where you've got, a, a let's say, a company like Procter & Gamble who's selling products on the Amazon site is also spending money on advertising. So this is a complete win-win for Amazon. You, you basically get the, the consumer data, you basically keep the transaction on the site, and it's a win for the brand manager or proctor who can point to, you know, to the VP of marketing, to the CMO, and show what kind of a lift that they're getting. So we're, we're bullish. We actually think there's some good things going on. Um, and there's some interesting updates, actually, as you're mentioning them, and uh, you know, on the, conceivably on the, the video front, with regards to uh, Amazon, Amazon Prime Video, they had talked at CES about exceeding more than 40 million devices at, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the end of the year. And uh, there, was, there was also some chatter that they're talking about going in and trying to sell other apps across some of the other devices, which... Uh, where does, yeah, where does that then leave some of those other competitors in the space? I'm thinking Disney Plus and Netflix, which we were mentioning before this segment with you, now potential Oscar nominations. Well, I mean, I think it's, uh, I, I don't know if it's necessarily a bad thing for, for Disney Plus. I, 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 for what it's worth, I mean, let me just step back and just level set. Prime video, in my opinion, I, I, I think of the Amazon business is really two, two primary things. I mean, you've got AWS, and then you've really got retail, and in my opinion, all the things that drive the Prime flywheel round. So what I think Amazon might conceivably be thinking about doing is trying to go ahead, conceivably even give the fire the fire hardware away for free, and maybe you'll start to look at seeing a, you know, a subsidized prime offering um, that could come out at some point during the course of the year. So to the extent they can, they can build a more robust video ecosystem on the advertising side, that would allow them right. to subsidize that. So that, that's pretty compelling. Yeah. Well, an update on that. Advertising Insights with Michael Levine of Pivotal Research. Thank you for joining us. And in coming up, we look at the world's biggest chip maker. It's trying to do as the U.S. and China reach a trade deal. All of that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology Global Link, where we join Bloomberg Daybreak Australia to bring you the latest in global tech news. I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco with Sherry Ann in New York and Heidi Stroud-Watts in Sydney. Let's take a look at those top global tech stories of the day. Sherry. Taylor is a bachelor in space. A Japanese billionaire seeks a special woman to fly with him to the moon. Yusaku Maezawa, the first paying passenger on the 2023 SpaceX's maiden tourist voyage, is looking for applicants through a documentary he commissioned called Full Moon Lovers. He is the founder of online fashion retailer Zozo and has a net worth of $3.6 billion. Jeff Bezos is slated to headline the inaugural session of Amazon India's event for small and medium businesses in New Delhi this week, but he's likely to face protests by more than half a million local traders who are against Amazon's pricing and exclusive selling practices. Bezos' visit comes as India's Competition Commission opens an antitrust probe into Amazon and Walmart's Flipkart. More than 560 million Indian internet users will soon have an unprecedented amount of control over their digital financial footprints. Backed by the Reserve Bank of India, the country's top banks are rolling out a system that gives consumers access to their data and the choice of what to share and with whom. The effort aims to protect data and unlock the credit market. 
Those are the top global tech stories we're watching. Taylor? Sherry, as the U.S.-China Phase 1 trade deal is set to be signed this week, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, its a major chip maker to both Apple and Huawei, has recruited rival Intel's former top lobbyist, Peter Cleveland, to spearhead an effort in Washington. The world's biggest contract chip maker is stepping up U.S. lobbying to ease the fallout from the ongoing trade tensions. To discuss, Bloomberg's Ian King joins us. Is this a sign that maybe they're worried about their relationship given now they're hiring a top lobbyist. Yeah, I mean, if they're not, then perhaps they should be because what we've seen over the last year or so amid the trade war is that pretty much anything is, is, that was thought to be normal and, and the way that the, that the whole supply chain worked is now off the table and is open to renewed scrutiny, particularly in Washington. Ian, it's hard to overestimate the significance or how crucial TSMC is to the supply chain. Yeah, 100%. I mean, they get cited as being oh, Apple's biggest supplier, but they're also Huawei's biggest supplier. They're also Qualcomm's biggest supplier. They're also NVIDIA's biggest supplier. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And that's not just because they're the cheapest game in town and you can go elsewhere. It's because now they're the best in town. They have some of the best factories in the world and some of the most advanced semiconductors are produced there. And if their biggest suppliers are both Apple and Huawei, if yeah. one wanted to choke off Huawei, to do so would to do so via Taiwan Semiconductor. Yeah, I mean, this is the biggest question, I think, that's hanging around in a lot of people's minds, is if you are the U.S. government and you are determined that Huawei is going to remain an enemy and needs to be shut down, a lot of the chips that Huawei gets, whether it designs it itself or whether it gets them elsewhere, are made in those factories in Xinchu in Taiwan. If you wanted to really, really shut down Huawei as an entity, TSMC would be a real choke point. And is this a standard kind of new operating practice for companies that have Chinese business links or Chinese business interests to really step up lobbying in 2020? Yeah, well, I mean, as we saw in our story, you know, that, that, that Debbie did out of Taiwan, it's, it's a, you know, people are spending more, Huawei is spending more. And I think because of the increasing uncertainty, at the very least, you have to have more people on the ground speaking to more people in, in the corridors of power in Washington because not only are we seeing more action being taken, but we're seeing an increase in, in the sort of noise around who's doing what, who's thinking what, and who's going to take what action. So it, it really sort of pays to be paying more to be finding out what's going on. And what do we know about Peter Cleveland and what he may or may not have done formerly at Intel that could give us insight into perhaps some of the next steps at Taiwan? Yeah, I mean, Intel, the world's largest semiconductor mm -hmm. company, it's obviously hand in hand with the U.S. government in terms of the sense of companies that are important to the U.S. and to the U.S. economy. It's been lobbying and making that point for years. If he's been part of that, he's going to know the right people. He's going to know the right processes. He's going to know whose door to knock on. So that's definitely something that TSMC could use. Mm -hmm. And is the recovery or the bottoming out when it comes to the chip industry or cycle at least providing some respite despite these political challenges being ongoing? Yeah, I mean, you saw some numbers out of Korea. We've seen Samsung Electronics do its preliminary earnings and talk about how prices are getting better. And this is something that uh, a lot of people look at is the memory chip price trends as being a, an open indicator of where demand is. And the hope there is, I think, that 5G phones are going to require a lot more memory and going to create a lot more data. They're going to need a lot more storage. And we're going to have to see some you know, demand in the back end, which is the data centers of companies like Google. They're going to start building out their infrastructure again. And all of these are being taken as early indicators that we're going to see you know, a better 2020 in terms of the fall through for earnings. Bloomberg's Ian King, all things chips. Thank you for joining us. And much more ahead, so stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Optimism swelling around Apple as DA Davidson analyst Tom Forte has raised his price target to $375 a share. He cited the potential of 5G as his reason. Apple is already enjoying a rally due to strong iPhone sales in China. Shares touched intraday records Monday. Now, Sonos recently went to war with Google, suing the Internet search giant for infringing five patents 
for wireless home speakers. Google says its technology was developed independently. Some believe the latest legal maneuver is a way for Sonos to get royalties from its designs or prepare for a takeover. With more on this story and the overall trend of upstarts fighting against the pool of industry giants is attorney Ira Blumberg of Voice Labs and Brad Stone, senior executive editor for Bloomberg Technology. So first, Brad, let me get your take on Sonos and Google. What does this say sort of about Sonos specifically and then where we are in the fight against Amazon? Right. Well, it's, it's kind of a movie we've seen a number of times before in, in tech. Um, I, I feel like Sonos is kind of having its TiVo moment, right? It was a pioneer, it was an innovator. It, it really introduced the concept of multi-room networking with speakers. And then in 2014, there was an earthquake in this market. Elect Amazon introduced Alexa. Suddenly, speakers were voice activated. Sonos was a step behind. It tried to integrate Alexa and Google's technology. Um, I'm not qualified to talk about the merits of the lawsuit, but clearly Sonos is seeing a market that's racing ahead. Google and Amazon discounting their speakers. You know, TiVo found a path forward in DVRs by licensing its tech. And that's the royalty stream that, that Sonos wants to unlock. So, Ira, we come to you. How does a company like Sonos survive in this environment? It's a tough one because, among other things, what we've seen is Sonos has a fairly high price point, and Google and Amazon can sell their products for a lot less money for a couple of reasons. My understanding is that the, the Google and Amazon products are not as high fidelity, but consumers don't seem to be that concerned. They're interested in the voice recognition technology, and some background music. And so that's going to be a problem for Sonos because they're in a price squeeze. They're having trouble being profitable even at their high, high pricing, and they're getting squeezed by the lower end of the market. What they appear to be doing is trying to get a royalty stream from the companies that have integrated or allegedly integrated their existing technology. Well, and that brings us to a different company, Mossimo, uh, uh, suing now Google, I, I believe, or Apple Watch. Sorry, I'm all over the place today. Apple, Apple. over their health right. technology. Uh, does this case differ, or is this a similar issue of a big tech company, perhaps allegedly, stealing a, a small company's technology? Right. Uh, this one's a little different. Uh, to me, the fact pattern's a little bit more troubling. Uh, so Mossimo is a health tech company. It makes sensors to monitor, like, your heartbeat. Um, Apple said it wanted to work with Massimo in 2013. They had meetings, and then two very senior executives of Massimo went to work at, can you guess, Apple. Mm -hmm. And now several years later, Massimo is suing the company, saying you, you took our best people and you took our technology. The fact pattern, if this is one day a jury trial um, over a patent IP infringement, it looks bad. But again, it, it, it gets down to the merits of the, the patent, which mm -hmm. Apple will probably try to in, in, invalidate, and how much Apple actually copied the technology. Well, and Brad, you in your story, you have this uh, word, if you will, called seedlings. Uh, explain that to me, sort of seeding over market share. Right, yeah, it was sort of this playful uh, <laughs> uh, group, uh, word to convey the group of companies who, who are pioneers and find themselves ceding market share to the big tech platforms. Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, you, you know, there's a whole bunch of these companies. And look, I mean, I said before, this is a script we've seen before in tech, and it's kind of how tech works and has worked over, over decades. You know, big tech, tech platforms emerge and kind of, you know, become kind of black holes or gravitational centers for technology. And the, and the little companies, they can succeed, right? I mean, you know, Sonos is still valued quite, quite highly. Um, Spotify, you know, there are many others, but it becomes mm -hmm. increasingly more difficult. Ira, what do you make? What does this show about how some of these smaller tech companies initially want to partner with a big company to work with them, but then they do face the risk, as we've seen with Sonos, Fitbit, Massimo, where then they are at risk of having some of that technology allegedly stolen? Well, it is a, it, it's a quandary because for a small company to get traction in the marketplace, they frequently do have to interface with and be compatible with existing platforms like Amazon, like Google, or on the hardware side like Microsoft and, and Intel. Um, at the same time, if they open the kimono too far, they do expose some of their secret sauce, which makes it easier for these existing companies to duplicate what the small companies have pioneered. The other problem, of course, is that if you're a small company focused on a single function product, you are immediately susceptible to the inevitable integration that the hardware world constantly strives for. The, the mobile phone is a perfect example of that. When they started out, 
you could talk on a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. Over the years, they incorporated so many more functions cameras, movie cameras, music players. So today, you, you look back, there was once a very healthy iPod and music player market. Nobody buys those anymore. You just plug your earbuds or wirelessly connect your earbuds to your phone. So you've got all this integration that has really put aside a lot of these standalone products. Look at the camera companies. Nobody sells a point and shoot camera anymore mm -hmm. because your phone does it better. Well, and Ira, we were sort of joking here on Bloomberg Technology. You get some of these small companies, and we always ask, what's your good exit strategy, right? Like short of an IPO, is it better perhaps to be a Sonos, to try to stand alone, to fight back against a seedling, as Brad would call them? Or would you be a Fitbit, perhaps be open to being acquired? And is that a better uh, a strategy in terms of protecting your technology? In all of your years, what, would you, uh, what do you see? What would you recommend? I would say if a company can get a good valuation in, in a buyout, that's probably the safest and, and best path because there will be integration over time. And if you're a single technology or a single product company, it's almost inevitable that at some point some larger company is going to integrate your functionality at a much lower cost than you can compete with. So your choices are diversify and become a multi-product company, just as Apple did, I mean, with the smartphone. If smartphones had just stayed phones, they'd be single function devices. But companies figured out, hey, if we integrate, it's more appealing to consumers. Mm -hmm. So if you're a small startup, one alternative is diversify. Another alternative is become attractive enough for an acquisition. The third, which it looks like Sonos may be trying for, is eventually phase out of product development and focus on technology development that you can then license to the big tech companies. Well, always too short of a conversation. Thank you to Brad Stone of Bloomberg Technology and Ira Blumberg of Video Labs. Now, Zenmeat has been dubbed the Chinese version of Impossible Foods and launched its plant-based meat products on the market last year. Co-founder Vincent Liu spoke to Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie on the sidelines of the UBS Greater China Conference in Shanghai on how competition for this market is shaking out in China. The government definitely wants more plant protein intake for, you know, the consumers and Chinese consumers. But also we, we had, unfortunately, we have the smart fever last year. So it doubled the effect of the, you know, the plant-based food sector. So a lot of food company is noticing this new area. And uh, like our um, competitor in the U.S., like Beyond Meats and uh, Impossible Foods, they have done very successful marketing and uh, product development in the U.S. market. So people are ex ex expecting, um, you know, there's, if there is company or if there is market for, you know, mainland China. Do you have an estimate for the value of the market in China over the next five to ten years? Is there a dollar number that you have that you can that you're putting to your investors? It's very hard to tell right now, but what we have is a very solid prediction because in China, the plant-based milk or plant-based drinks, you know, substitute around 15% of the dairy market, right? So it's reasonable to see plant-based meat can substitute like around 10% 10, 10 or up to 15% of the pork or the meat market in mm. China. Yeah. Mm. Uh, now, you talked about Impossible Foods yes. and Beyond Meat. They're knocking at the door of the Chinese market. They do yeah. face some regulatory hurdles, though. How do you ensure that you can be in a position in the Chinese market to fend off that kind of competition? Yeah, I don't see that as a competition right now because we're too small. We're just small and starting up company. I'm really excited if they will go to mainland China because that's going to open the market. That's going to educate people. The, the, the reason and the main goal is the same. We want to let people eat more plant-based protein, more plant-based food, other than animal protein or animal-based food, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a, we have the same vision and the same result we want to achieve. So it's, it's going to be better if they enter the Chinese market as soon as possible. As soon as possible, you welcome, you yeah, welcome the entrance of, of Impossible Foods and of Beyond Meat into the of market. Course, of course. Mm. What is the funding situation for Gen Meat right now? Uh, we're raising Andrew's round. We're open to you know, talking to investors from US and, uh, of course, mainland China, because uh, more and more local investors are uh, you know, getting notice about this field. But I understand like investors from US or Europe are more familiar 
with this field. And they also share the vision of why alternative protein is an important sector in food and agriculture sector. So how much runway do you have at this point? Uh, we're looking to 1 million to 2 million USD. USD? Yeah, for the pre-A series. But you'll be, yeah. you'll be raising in the next couple of months, you're hoping? Yes. Okay. Yes. Too, is it too early to start talking about IPO plans for the company? Yes, too early. Right yeah. now, it's too early, yeah. That was Zenmi co-founder Vince Liu speaking with Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie. And it's still ahead. We'll find out why Secretary of State Michael Pompeo wants to get closer to Silicon Valley leaders. And as we go to break, a milestone for Tesla. Shares of the electric car maker surged today, topping $500 for the first time. That's after Oppenheimer raised its price target on the stock to $612 a share. Plus, China's government signaled it wouldn't continue to cut EV subsidies at the same rate as last year. This is Bloomberg. Facebook's former general counsel, Theodore Ulyat, will oversee T-Mobile's acquisition of Sprint if the $26 billion telecom deal closes. A federal judge approved the Justice Department's appointment of Ulyat as the monitoring trustee. The fate of the merger is still uncertain as it faces a federal antitrust lawsuit by a group of state attorneys general. Ulyat has held multiple corporate counsel positions, most recently for Facebook, from 2008 to 2013. And Attorney General William Barr has requested Apple to provide access to two iPhones used by the gunman in the Pensacola Naval Base shooting. He declares it was an act of terrorism. The appeal is an escalation of an ongoing fight between law enforcement and big tech, pit pitting privacy against public security. Apple has given investigators materials from the iCloud account of the Florida gunman, but it has refused to help the FBI open the phones. The company's top privacy executive says iPhone security and encryption mean that it can't access on-device data even if it wanted to. Now, Secretary of State Michael Pompeo is planning to attend a private dinner on Monday in San Francisco with tech leaders, including Oracle's Larry Ellison. This is all according to sources. The dinner comes days after Pompeo announced new sanctions on Iran amid rising tensions. For more, I'm joined by Bloomberg Technologies or Bloomberg Sarah Fryer. What do we know about this meeting between Pompeo and tech leaders? So Pompeo is trying to garner up more support for the Trump administration among tech leaders, and the timing is certainly interesting given our recent tensions with Iran. So I'm sure that that will be a talk of the dinner, but there are also a lot of other issues that tech leaders care about right now, like immigration, uh, the, the trade war. All of these issues are bubbling up to become very real for executives here in Silicon Valley. It's not just Larry Ellison going, it's also Mark Andreessen, who's a prominent venture capitalist, Sarah Fryer, not me, but the CFO, <laughs> uh, the, the CEO of Nextdoor. And, and it, it's, you know, gearing up to be a really interesting private event. Uh, of course, these executives still are not cavorting often publicly with members of the Trump administration. Well, and I like that you brought up the tensions with Iran, because what was notable from the list is a lot of the cybersecurity experts. We've spoken with a number of them in the last few weeks, um, and you wonder, would Mike Pompeo also potentially be meeting with some cybersecurity technology firms? I absolutely think he, he would like to do that. I, it's it's a very interesting timing right now, uh, given that there is so much going on in D.C. for him to be here. And he's speaking at the Commonwealth Club tonight as well. Uh, so I think that, that for these executives, you know, who knows how long this administration, it could be another four years. They really need to establish these relationships and understand where they can come in on policy changes, be up to date on what's happening, and certainly it'll be it'll be Pompeo's job to, to really bridge that gap here tonight. Well, and when you talk about relationships, frankly, it seems that for many of these big tech companies, relationship has never been lower. You think of all the antitrust, all the data privacy concerns coming from the Trump administration that have fallen really on, on big tech. It doesn't seem like the relationship could get worse. Am I right? It really does seem to be a bipartisan issue to yeah. want to scrutinize big tech companies further. And, and I would say, you know, with, the, with an instance like this, we have seen a lot of employee uproar in the past when their leaders 
meet with Trump or members of his administration. We saw a lot of uproar when Tim Cook went on that factory tour with Trump, when Mark Zuckerberg had a private dinner with him. So uh, I'm, I'll be interested to see if anything happens this week on that. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at Quick Take on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.